Matthew 5, John 13, Titus 3, Psalm 37. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray now that as we dig into your word that you would give us understanding. So not only would we know the word, but we'd have the opportunity to live it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 5. We're continuing to walk through the Beatitudes, and there in verse 5, Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness. Let me give you a story. You don't need to turn there. It's from Luke's Gospel, chapter 9. I'll explain it. Jesus and the disciples are walking to Jerusalem. They are going from Galilee. They're going to have to pass through a village called Samaria. Through that village, they've been walking for several miles. They know there are more miles to walk. They decide we're going to lodge here for the night before we continue our journey on into Jerusalem. Well, I need to let you know something about Jewish people and Samaritan people. They don't like each other. In fact, when Jesus was on trial, the worst thing that could be said, one of the Jewish Pharisees said of Jesus, You're a Samaritan! That was like, <gasps> he called him a Samaritan because the Jews thought they were dogs. They didn't like them at all. Now, this was the first century world, okay? So just stay with me because the Samaritans, they didn't like the Jews either. So when Jesus and his disciples are walking through the Samaritan village, they decide to stay there and the Samaritan goes, you're not welcome here. Get out, you Jew. Well, I need to give you some geography here for just a minute. The Samaritan village was right under Mount Carmel. Now that should ring a bell in your heart and mind because Elijah was on Mount Carmel. And if you remember, he brought fire down from heaven which consumed the sacrifice that was on the mountain. Well, James and John, the disciples of Jesus, they're looking at Mount Carmel, thinking about this story. They come up with a great idea. And they walk up to Jesus and said, listen, <laughs> we don't like these Samaritan people anyway. Let's bring fire down from heaven and burn them all up, Jesus. I can only imagine the Lord. I'm leaving the kingdom with these people. Just imagine for just a moment, the very people he came to save, they want to burn alive, all right? And John, you're going to be really embarrassed in just a couple of months because I'm going to send you back here because there's going to be a great revival amongst the Samaritans. And so let me tell you something, you don't want to burn them up because you're going to be experiencing something incredible. Now, why would I tell you the story? Because this has nothing to do with meekness. Even Jesus would tell James and John, take a look, it's Luke chapter 9, verse 55. He would say to them, but he turned and rebuked them and said, you don't know what spirit, manner of spirit you're of. For the Son of Man didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Jesus just went to another village because what James and John was doing is the exact opposite to what meekness is. It's a display of the word, world, not the word. They wanted to bring down fire. They wanted to bring down violence. Well, it's no different really than our day. It's no different than the day that we live in. You see, I believe that we're living in the days of Noah. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 11, the earth was filled with violence. One of the things that we did while we were at Philippi is not only did we see where Paul was jailed and where Lydia was baptized, we got to see the gladiator's arena. It's overwhelming to think about. I stood there in the center imagining myself to be one of the Christians that were eaten by the wild beasts. I stood there for myself thinking, me who is not like Mr. Swordslayer, imagining a gladiator coming towards me who is professionally trained and there are thousands of people about to watch my execution. How could they stand there and this was entertainment? They were watching human beings slaughtered and they would sell ticket after ticket for the gladiator's arena. Can I tell you? It's no different today. I've got two words to tell you that will tell you the truth. 
Black Friday. Any of you ever been to Walmart on Black Friday? <laughs> Have you ever seen Two women fight over a TV like you see at Walmart on Black Friday. Well, you don't have to go. Let me tell you why. There are people that go to Walmart with their phones just waiting for the fight so that they can video it. And it's not just thousands of people of watch on social media. There are millions of people that will watch one gal grabbing the hair of another gal and the other gal doing this thing. And everyone watches it as entertainment. Jesus rebukes that. And he says, that's not for believers today. You don't know what manner of spirit you're of because this is not the spirit of Jesus. He didn't come to destroy. So he just left the Samaritan village. He just walked away from it. He didn't feel the need to engage with them because he didn't come to destroy. He came to save. Turn turn a few pages with me over to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, I want you to see this. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Listen to how Jesus describes himself. Matthew 11, verse 28. He says this. Come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Listen to the direction. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in spirit, and you'll find rest for your souls. He says, I'm meek. And he says this, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says, I'm lowly and gentle. I am meek. Now, I want you to see here something. I didn't say meek, weak. I said meek, not weak, meek. Weak, meek. Meek and weak. I don't want you to confuse the terms because I didn't say weak. I said meek because the two terms, weak and meek, have nothing in common. Because there was nothing weak about carrying the cross, Jesus is meek. There's nothing weak about challenging the Roman Pontius Pilate, because Jesus is meek. There is nothing weak about standing up to the religious leaders, because Jesus is meek. You see, I believe his meekness is best expressed in Matthew chapter 26. It's Matthew 26, verse 53. You'll see it on the screen. Matthew 26, verse 53, speaking to the leaders, or do you think that I cannot pray to my father and he'll provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? You know what he's telling the leaders? I can call on 12,000 angels right now. But he didn't. Let me tell you, if I was in front of them and I knew I had the power to call out 12,000 angels and you'd be gone, let me tell you something, brother. You're going down. (laughs) But not Jesus. He's meek. Remember, he walked away from the Samaritan village. He didn't engage in argument. And his meekness is power under control. No, wait a second. Maybe you've heard that definition before, but I believe that meekness is more than just power under control because then I can describe meekness as a nuclear power plant. It's power under control. It's a nuclear power under so much control that you get electricity into your houses because of a nuclear power plant. So it's not just simply power under control. No, no, it's much more than that. It's not an entity. It's a person. You see, I believe meekness is the power of the Holy Spirit in control of your life. It's the person, not a nuclear power plant. It's the person of the Holy Spirit moving through you with self-control. And Jesus, he embodies the term. And in Matthew chapter 5, he says, blessed are the meek. He blesses us with meekness so that we can be conformed into his image. He is the Lamb of God and he is the Lion of Judah. He is gentle and he is strong. In fact, he says, take my yoke upon you. The pursuit of meekness is the pursuit of Christ. 
He's inviting us into a different life. He's taking us out of the violent ro- world. He's taking us out of road rage and anger that exists in our culture. I mean, just look at the riots that's been happening here and around the world. The angrier I am, the more violent I am, the more people will hear me. We are living in the days of Noah. So you get a choice. And your choice... Will you be as gentle as a lamb, or will you be as strong as a lion, or will you choose to be gentle as a lamb and strong as a lion? One author, he described meekness as patient forbearance. Patient forbearance. Let me give you a personal story. During the war in Liberia, when we were missionaries there, we rescued child soldiers. You know that. And I would go into the jungle... I have traveled every jungle path you can imagine in Liberia. I have walked from here to kingdom come, literally, through the nation of Liberia. And I would go and I would speak, walk for hours and speak to the commander who was about 17 or 18 years old. And my first prayer was, Lord, please don't let him kill me when I show up. My second prayer was, please let him listen to me if he doesn't kill me. And I went to this one place, it was about a four, four and a half hour walk, and I got to the rebel base. And I would say, hey, please let me have your seven and eight year old children. Let me find their parents. Let me take them and give them foster parents. I was doing everything I can to rescue these kids. Well, one particular place that I went, as soon as I got there, I got malaria. Now, I don't know if you know what malaria is. It's not a great disease. It's the world's number one killer. And when you get it, your fever spikes to like 104, 105 in about an hour. You feel like your brain is an egg on a frying pan. And what you do is, you know how an egg, when it's frying, it shakes? You can see it bubbling up on the frying pan? Your body does that. And you just shake like this, and you can't even control yourself because you're so cold from the fever, and your body is doing everything it can fight to stay alive. Well, I got so sick that the guy that I was with, he put me on his back and carried me all the way back for four and a half hours. And when he got tired of me on his back, he held me in his arms and I'm shaking like this and he is patiently forbearing my weight for four and a half hours. He took my burden upon himself. Meekness. I'll never forget another picture for you. It was about 10 years ago. There were three moms. You see our announcement for VBS. But these three moms, they did a VBS in Indonesia. It's illegal. And so they were accused of proselytizing Jesus. So the Muslims went radical. And they put them on trial. And as they were walking into the trial, these three moms, the oldest of which was about 38 years old, These three moms are walking into the courtroom and the Muslims are screaming, death to the infidels, murder them, kill the blasphemers. They exhibited all of their power. These three moms just walked in and they sit down and let me tell you something, though everybody in the courtroom was showing their power, the most powerful people in the room that day were those three moms that were patiently forbearing the trial that was upon them. Meekness. Meekness. You see, I wanted to give you a visual picture, but John gives us a picture as well of the a visual of Jesus' meekness. Would you turn with me to John chapter 13? I want you to see John does such a better job of giving us the visual, and there are three things about the meekness of Jesus that I want us to see in this chapter. John chapter 13, I'm going to start reading from verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover... When Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and he was going to God. Verse 4, he rose from supper, laid aside his garments. He did it took a towel and girded himself. After that, 
He poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Meekness. There are three things about the meekness of Jesus that I want you to write down. The first is this. His spirit-filled love. John tells us he loved them. He loved them to the end. To the end. And let me tell you, these disciples, they were difficult to love. I mean, do you remember he called them a faithless generation? He called them a perverse generation? He was constantly having to deal with them, but he loved them. He loved them to the end. No matter what they brought his way, he chose to love them because he was filled with the Spirit. Take a look at the screen. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, love, joy peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now let me break this down for you to describe the meekness expressed in this very statement. You see, in our relationship to God, meekness is expressed with love, joy, peace. Let me explain. We have a love for God, and because of that love for God, he gives us a peace that passes understanding and an inexpressible joy. Meekness in our relationship with God is love, joy, and peace. Meekness in our relationship with others is our next three words. Long-suffering, kindness, and goodness. Now let me give you an example. Meekness expressed in our relationship with others is long-suffering, kindness, and goodness. If you're married and your spouse is here today, I want you to look at them and say, I'm going to be long-suffering, gentle, and kind with you all week. Go ahead. Go ahead and tell them. Okay, some of you are married and haven't looked at each other yet. That's called marital counseling. Give the church a call. Okay, let's try one more time. Look at your spouse and say, I'm going to be meek this week. I'm going to be long-suffering, gentle, and kind. Go ahead and say that. You have to mean it, okay? You see, those three words are our relationship with others. Then the next three words, we've got love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness. The next three words, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, is our representation of meekness in and of ourselves. We are faithful to God. It's expressed through gentleness to others out of us and self-control of our own lives. And so what we did was we took the nine fruit of the Spirit and we broke them down into three different parts to express Spirit-filled love that Jesus was showing the disciples. Secondly, I want you to write it down. Confident contentment. Meekness is best expressed in Jesus through his confident contentment. Let me explain. He knew where he had come from. And he knew where he was going. But let me explain something. Heaven is perfect. He left heaven and came to corruption, the corrupt earth. He had to go through a cross in order to get back to where he was going. And it didn't matter to Jesus because he was confidently content with whatever God provided for his life. He was confidently content in his relationship with God that no matter what God allowed him to go through, no matter what God directed for his life, he was able to do it because he was completely satisfied in his relationship with God. That's why on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He had never been separated from the Father. It's what grieved him most about the cross because Jesus didn't need anything else. His meekness was expressed in his confident contentment in his relationship with God the Father. Thirdly, it was Jesus that went and got the bowl of water. It was Jesus that girded himself like a slave. No one asked him to. Number three, I want you to write it down. He purposed to be lowly. No one asked him to. 
He purposed to be lowly. He took the action of becoming the servant of all. He dressed himself in order to accomplish the task. Jesus, John, excuse me, expresses the meekness of Jesus in John chapter 13. Paul, he capitalizes on the meekness of Jesus and he begins to explain to Titus the meekness of Jesus. Turn with me to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, Paul is going to further enlighten us to the meekness of Jesus. He's going to be describing who we are to become as he uses Jesus and his meekness as an example. But before we learn that, I want you to see the point of Titus. Look at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 verse 1. But as for you, he's speaking to Pastor Titus, as for you, Pastor Titus, Speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. I want you to teach Jesus. I want them to know Jesus. I want you to baptize in the name of Jesus. I want them to know his behavior, his character, his conduct. Teach sound doctrine. Take a look at the next. Next, I've actually underlined this in my Bible, verse 2, that the older men be. Be. Because what you believe will affect your behavior. I'm going to prove it to you. When you all came in and you sat down in the pew, why they call them a pew, I have no idea. Let's change the name officially to seat today, okay? When you came in and sat in your seat, I guarantee none of you went like this. Okay, you good? Let me press here. Are, are you going to hold me? No, no, no. You believed that the seat could hold you, so this is what you did. You walked in, and because you believed it, you behaved in it. You sat down. I did squats yesterday. I may not be able to get back up. <laughs> oh. You know, after 50, every time you get up out of a chair, like you start an ensemble of sounds. Your knees crack. <laughs> did you hear that? <laughs> so I'm not going to do it again. Um, but your belief affected your behavior. You came right in, and you sat down. Oh, did it. Um, and you sat right down. Belief affects behavior, and what Paul is saying is this. If you really believe that Jesus is meek, you'll behave meekly. You'll just behave that way. So Paul, he takes that understanding. Now let's pick it up in chapter 3 and hear what he says. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, here's the key, showing all humility to all men. You see, this word humility is the word meekness. And what he just defined is what meekness looks like. Show it to everybody. In the very first word, he says, be subject to rulers. Maybe you'll write it down. He's asking us to be reverent. You see, you actually have a lot of power. You've got to determine if it's controlled by the Spirit or not. Because God has given you a will. And you've got to ask yourself, am I going to be subject to my ruler? Will I respect God's authority in my life and do his will over mine, even if I don't feel like it? Are you reverent? Meekness also looks like obedience. It's the word to obey. Now let me tell you in the Greek what, to, what this word to obey means. In the Greek it means to obey. It means to obey. Now, you could, why did you repeat that if it's there in English? Because how many of us struggle with obedience? Go ahead, raise your hand. We've got like four honest people. I'm going to ask the question one more time. How many of us struggle with obeying God's rule in our life? That's why I repeated it. I understand. I'm with you. Do you know you have a huge power? It's called the gas pedal. You get to determine if you'll obey the law or not. And I've driven next to some of you. That's why I asked you twice, does any of you struggle with obedience? Because the speed limit is 65, but your foot's got more power than that. You got 85 in that foot, don't you? Huh? Well, meekness is the willingness to be obedient to the law. 
You've got the power to disobey it, but will you choose to be meek? Meekness all looks like ready for every good work. It means being prepared, being prepared. Let me tell you something. Your time, you got a lot of power. Your time is your own. You can do with it whatever you would like. This past Thursday, I talked about using your time for God and his glory. Be a servant, but your time is your own. How are you using it? He then says, speak evil of no one. This is being kind. Meekness looks like kindness. Now, I have a confession. Istanbul has a lot of people in it, and they're not the friendliest of people. And I was in the elevator, and this guy came in the elevator with his suitcase, and he literally pushed me aside to get his suitcase in. So you know what I did? I would love to say I'm like Jesus, and I did nothing. Something happened in me, and I pushed him back. And I thought to myself, Chet, you're about to teach on meekness, and you just pushed this guy who you're, you've come to Turkey to minister to these people, and now you're pushing them. Good Lord, help me. I had to confess it to you because I couldn't teach on kindness and then have that in my skeleton in my closet. But kindness is exactly that. You see, kindness is most tested when people are unkind to you. <laughs> Sometimes I will get waved at on the 405, and it's with a little special finger, and I don't know why <laughs> they're waving that special little finger my direction. It's like, why are you doing, what did I do? I don't know what I did. And I'll never forget when I was pastoring in Montana, um, I was driving down the road, and this woman, she came around me and cut me off. And as she was cutting me off, she waved that special little finger my direction. The only problem was she went to my church. So she went from the special finger to like, <laughs> like, like covering for it, right? So I went back and I went like this back to her, right? Well, you guys, you'll get to know me. You'll know me. I walked right up to her church. She goes, Pastor, I'm so sorry, but you were going so slow. You mean I was obeying the speed limit? It's kind. He says meekness is best expressed when you're peaceable. Peaceable. You're not contentious. You're not trying to pick a fight. You're never the one to cause the argument. He says that meekness is best expressed when you're gentle. Now, let me define this word gentle for you because I don't want you to think of pansy, okay? This word gentle, it means fair. It means equitable. It means unassertive. Now, let me let you know something. There's nothing passive about this word. There's nothing passive about this word because the most gentle moment of Jesus was when he was marching up to Mount Calvary with the cross on his back. Let me tell you what gentleness means. Gentle is not persuaded by your, your feelings in the moment. Gentle is directed by God with a greater purpose. I can choose to do what God has asked me to do and I won't let my feeling get in the way of it. That is a gentle Jesus. And the example of Jesus is found right here in Titus 3. Take a look, if you would. Go back with me to Titus chapter 3. I'm going to pick it up in verse 3. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Listen to the lack of meekness that existed in their life. But verse 4. But, in other words, a completely different story. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, when Jesus showed up, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. The washing of regeneration by the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Stop there if you would. He says, let me give you a model of meekness. His name is Jesus. It was the kindness of God that led us to repentance, not his anger. 
his kindness. He showed us meekness when we were enemies. And you know what he does? He pours out his spirit on us because he knows we've got to deal with humanity. He knows people are going to hurt us. But he doesn't just pour out his spirit on us. He pours it out on us abundantly. He asks us to be meek, and then he gives us the power of the Holy Spirit to do what he's asking us to do. You see, the example is Jesus. And let me explain the blessing of meekness on our lives. The blessing of meekness is this. We get to have a spirit-filled love. You see, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, the Bible says, Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ Jesus forgave you. It didn't matter what the disciples did to Jesus. He was going to be meek towards them and forgive them. He had a spirit-filled love. You see, you as well can have the blessing of being confidently content. Listen to what Paul says. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7. 1 Corinthians 6, 7. Now, therefore, it's already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? I'm going to answer Paul's question. Because when we're cheated and when someone does something wrong to us, it hurts. So the very thing we want to do, we want to hurt back. But there's a little problem verse with the whole hurt back thing. It's Romans chapter 12. The Holy Spirit says this, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But you know what we like to add at the end of it? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord's servant. So when that person comes in the elevator and goes, boom, God, I don't think you're in this elevator. Boom, back. I'll take care of him for you. God, forgive me. I don't know his heart. I don't know if he had a bad day. I don't know if his wife yelled at him. I don't know if his flight was late. All I know is that I got shoved and I had to shove back. Some of you are looking at me like, I can't believe you did that. I'm confessing my sin to you, okay? I know I can't believe that I did that, but I would rather be transparent with you than hold it in my heart. You see, church, listen. We've got a purpose to be lowly to express Jesus to this world. You see, when we purpose to be lowly, we can get along with each other. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. You'll see it on the screen. With all lowliness, with all meekness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. What he's saying, when you purpose to take the insult, when you purpose to understand that they may be having a bad day and you walk away from it like Jesus did in the Samaritan village, you're purposing to be lowly. You're choosing not to engage in the provocation. Now, the blessing of meekness, it blesses the Lord. It blesses the Lord. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3 that a gentle and quiet spirit, a meek spirit, blesses the Lord. It gives him pleasure. I'll give you an example. It's Matthew chapter 8. You don't need to turn there. It's Matthew chapter 8. Roman centurion comes to Jesus. Now, let me tell you, Roman centurions, they were jacked. Do you know what you had to do to be a Roman centurion? You had to kill. You had to kill a lot of people. You had to be skilled and gifted in killing. So just imagine this jacked Roman centurion. Now, here's the whole thing I don't get. Just imagine you look like this, and you got to wear the little Roman miniskirt. How embarrassing, <laughs> right? It's like, are you kidding me? You couldn't find something else than a miniskirt to wear? It's like, here they come, boom, boom, and they got a miniskirt on, right? So just imagine the scene. This guy comes in to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, my servant is sick, and you better do something about it. I'm a man of power. It's not what happened. Guy comes in, hey, Jesus, I'm really not worthy for you to come under my roof. And I know, because I'm a man under authority, that if you just say the word, my servant can be healed. Do you know what Jesus said, looking at that meekness? You know what he said? I have not seen such great faith in Israel. 
Jesus said this. Great faith is displayed in meekness. Not going to Istanbul. Not ministering to undisclosed country of undisclosed country people. No, no, no. Great faith is displayed by meekness. And you know what Matthew wrote in Matthew 8? He wrote this. And Jesus marveled. Something about Jesus' faith made Matthew write, wow, he's amazed by this. Now just imagine heaven. Just imagine heaven. Okay? Sally comes over to you. Sally gets in the elevator and shoves you because you're in the elevator. And you make a decision. Okay, Sally, you want to give a little shove? I'm going to shove you back. Jesus goes, what a faithless gent. Let's imagine now. Sally comes into the elevator. And you look at her after she's pushed you and even bruised you. And you say, God bless you. Do you know what Jesus does? Hey, Dad, you got to see this. You never, look at this. She didn't slap her. She didn't talk about her. She looked at her and said, God bless you. Jesus marvels in heaven when we choose the great faith in our violent world to be meek. Now, in Titus chapter 3, we get to see the remainder of the blessing. He says this. Chapter 3, verse 7, that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Do you remember what Jesus said? Blessed are the meek, for they shall, future tense, they shall inherit the earth. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 10, Revelation chapter 5, verse 10, the Bible says he's going to make us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Do you realize there's a blessing for the church, for those of us that believe, during the thousand year reign, we get to rule over the earth. Now here's the thing. I'm praying for New Zealand. I'm really, I'm asking God, I want New Zealand. I don't know if you ever saw Lord of the Rings, but like the mountains, the beach, like the whole thing. It's like, whoa, I love New Zealand. Now, please, don't pray for New Zealand because I'm, I'm working hard to get it, okay? I want you to pray for like the Bahamas or Jamaica. Like, you know, pray for California if it's still here. God bless California, right? We, we will get to inherit the earth. But the meek really don't care about that because they're totally satisfied in their relationship with God. They're totally satisfied with what God has given them. They're able to walk away from a Samaritan village instead of engage in conflict because of a spirit-filled love. They're able to purpose to be lowly because though they possess nothing, they own everything. You see, the meek... They're not worried about tomorrow. They're content with what God has given them today. So, Father, I come before you in Jesus' name. And I'm asking that you would fill your church with a spirit of meekness. And as we remember you now with communion, would you grant us the grace to truly remember you? When you were coming in, you should have received the communion elements. If you didn't, I'm going to invite our ushers to come down and just simply raise your hand. We want to make sure that every one of you gets the communion elements. But I need to let you know something. Communion is about remembering Jesus. I know for me, I remembered him this morning when I took communion for the first time and I asked him for forgiveness for shoving the guy in the elevator. Because communion reminds the believer I can get back right with God. I can remember his grace and his forgiveness. 
his blood that was shed and his body that was broken for me. And that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. So Jesus knew we'd be quick to forget. That's what happened in the elevator. I forgot who I was. So communion, he says, listen, I'm going to give you a way to remember me because I know, Chet, you're quick to forget. But I need to let you know something else about communion. It's only for believers. Now you may go, that's exclusive. No. It's actually an invitation. You see, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, communion is an invitation. Let me explain. None of you are perfect. Not one of you. And the only way to be with God is perfection. You can't be in the presence of God imperfect. And the Bible says that we were born into sin, which means we are sinners. Now that's not a politically correct word, but I don't care. It's a biblical word. And as sinners, we're in need of a savior. So here's what Jesus did. He says, they can't live a perfect life, but I can. So I'm gonna leave the perfection of heaven. I'm gonna go into the corruption of the world and I'm gonna live the perfect life. And after I live the perfect life, I'm gonna pay the price of their sin. And I'm gonna die because death is the penalty of sin. Death is here because sin is here. So, Jesus didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose from the grave and because of the resurrection, he has conquered death. And let me tell you what that means. That means he alone is the only one that can give you eternal life. Because death no longer is in control. He is. And he says, if you'll just believe in me, what I did, I did all the work for you, then you can go to heaven. I need to let you know something. After the second service, someone walked up to me and said, well, I don't believe in Jesus and I didn't accept him today. And I said, well, then I hate to tell you this. You have another eternal destiny. It's called hell. Separated from God for eternity. And his wife began to cry. And I said, you know, the greatest gift that you could give your wife today is if you choose to believe. Now, I know you may not like this truth, but it is truth. Because 10 out of 10 of us in this room are going to take a last breath. You get to choose with all the power of, that you got. Will you choose meekness and give your power to Jesus? And so communion's an invitation if you choose to believe. So here's what we're going to do before we take communion. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And if you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior today and know that you're going to heaven, I want you to pray that prayer. And then, no longer is communion exclusive because it never was. It became the invitation. So it's going to be my words. Let it be from your heart. So church, let's pray. And I'll lead you. Dear Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you're the Son of God who lived a perfect life and died for me. Thank you for raising from the dead. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, you're a believer. Because the Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you're going to be saved. And now communion was the invitation it's meant to be. So now church, on that night, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body of the new covenant, which is broken for you. And as long as you do this, I want you to remember me Church, let's remember the Lord. And then he took the cup. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant, my blood shed for you. As long as you drink it, 
I want you to remember me. Let's remember the Lord. Sweet Savior, we remember you. We remember your grace, we remember your love, we remember your forgiveness. We pray now that you'd move in this room. In Jesus' name. Amen. You see, Jesus called his disciples publicly. And I believe that we should do the same. So I'm going to ask Pastor Pat to come and meet me here at the pulpit. And if you're a believer and you remembered the Lord, refreshing your relationship with him, reviving your relationship with him today as you remembered him in communion, I'm going to ask, like so many in our other services, you cut up out of your seat and you say today, I'm starting my new walk with the Lord. But if today you didn't know Jesus, and you accepted him today as your personal Savior and Lord for the very first time, I want you as well to come forward. Now here's what's going to happen when you do. Just like in all of our services, Christians are going to erupt in praise to God. They're going to let you know, we're with you, we're supporting you, because as you go out of that world and be meek, it's different. They're violent. But in the church, we're gentle and joyful and peaceful. And the Spirit's working on your heart now, so when Alex begins to sing this very same first note, you get up out of your seat and come forward. We're going to meet you here, and we're going to pray with you, and I guarantee this step of faith is going to give you the power as you walk out of this building to live for Jesus. So you come. We're praying. Alex, would you sing? Uh, would you start in a song? Christian, would you be in prayer? church as if you're laying hands on them I'm going to lead us in prayer and we want you to know we're with you you decided today to walk with the Lord in a refreshed and renewed relationship and God's going to honor this step of faith in your life Father we come before you for those that have publicly made the decision to follow you with all their heart, soul, mind and strength exhibited by a step of faith in coming forward just like you called the disciples publicly and I pray now with every tear being dropped that you would catch those tears and use it to refresh them and pour out living water abundantly upon them by the power of your Holy Spirit. Jesus, would you move in the lives of those that are here? And I pray that those that are standing here would be living such a life for you that they would then set an example as they have already today. Thank you for their faith and their life in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Hey. We want to pray with you. Pastor Pat is right here. You're going to be back with your friends in just a moment. Would you mind going with Pastor Pat and just meeting someone there to pray with you in the back? Church, would you applaud them as they go? Hey, Calvary Chapel, South Bay, we memorize scripture here. So if you'll take a look, it's Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. We'll be memorizing it this week. Would you say it with me? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. As well, every Sunday we give you a challenge to change. Here's our challenge this week, purpose to be meek. You get tested out in the parking lot. We're going to close in this song. Let's worship the Lord Jesus Christ with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength.